the main uh, components that we saw, uh, like uh, the upsampling and the convolutional layers, uh, uh, this came out of uh, different architectures that were developed for semantic segmentation. One of the first uh, perhaps, that perhaps started the, uh, uh, the whole trend of using fully convolutional networks for segmentation is uh, the uh, fully convolutional network by um, Long that was uh, published in CPR. Um, it basically was one of the first to propose um, uh, the idea of removing fully connected layers and uh, having a fully convolutional architecture that could be used to predict uh, this uh, semantic segmentation map. Um, and it does uh, this dense prediction uh, using an existing backbone. So specifically, it uses uh, the VGG16 uh, backbone as a feature extractor. So you can see here the different um, uh, convolutional layers followed by uh, max pooling layers. And their idea was that after going through the final uh, convolutional seven, as it is marked, uh, which is the final convolutional layer, um, is to upsample that um, layer and then do uh, dense prediction. So the idea there is to basically do some uh, interpolation and increase the size of this uh, output feature map by uh, 32 times. Since it was um, uh, decreased by 32 times through the downsampling process, and then do um, the prediction of the, of the label for each pixel. This particular uh, branch is called FCM32 because it upsamples the feature map uh, by 32 times. Uh, the problem here is that since we're getting something that is quite deep into the network, uh, we lose a lot of details uh, and a lot of uh, spatial uh, location information is lost since we're going deeper uh, into the network. Uh, and so what they did is uh, they added some other branches. So specifically, they combined um, uh, the output of the convolutional uh, seven layer the, uh, with the, an output that's coming from earlier in the network, so with a pooling layer. They um, upscaled the uh, final output by two times, and then they element-wise add together the feature maps uh, from the pooling. And they and this results in, um, uh, in an output that is 16 times upsampled um, compared to the previous, which was 32. Uh, and they also do prediction at that layer. They also did this one more time by upscaling this time the uh, convolutional seven by four times and the pooling by two times, and they added back the pooling from um, the third pooling layer, basically, and again uh, produced another prediction this time, which is much uh, at a much higher uh, resolution. So if we look at the output of each of these. Um, uh, networks, you can see that by starting from the FCN32 output, uh, we get a really rough uh, output. N not many details uh, are present. And as we um, increase to uh, and go to the 16, we start to see a better shape of the objects. And as we go to eight, uh, things are getting uh, much, uh, much better. Still, there's some detail that's missing if you look at the uh, ground truth, but the result is much closer to that rather than uh, the FCN uh, 32. So some more details about uh, the fully convolutional network. 
Um, the loss function is um, computed as the average of each of the uh, uh, three outputs or four of the pixels. Um, and the final output is combined to have um, a depth equal to the number of classes, as we saw in the previous uh, slides. Uh, and uh, the main outcome is that um, as we predict from uh, deeper layers, the output is more coarse. So we need some uh, higher um, layer information to retain the detail. And you can see this uh, again in this uh, example here, where we see uh, the main drawback of the fully convolutional approach is the poor resolution, especially um, at the boundaries. Also, the problem of artifacts when using deconvolution still um, is a problem, one of the problems of this method. So to combat this, um, uh, we, uh, another network was proposed, the deconfnet. Um, it's another network used for semantic uh, uh, segmentation. It again uses uh, the VDG as the backbone. So the encoder is uh, essentially the VDG network. Uh, and the first part is uh, a fully convolutional network as with, uh, with convolutional and pooling layers. And the second part is the deconvolutional network, uh, which is the novel part with respect to the uh, fully convolutional network. Uh, and the output is uh, gradually obtained by applying um, deconvolution and unpooling. Um, and essentially, it's the one that's proposed this unpooling method of uh, using the indices produced by the uh, pooling operations uh, in the encoder. Uh, and the good thing is that it does not involve any multiplication or summation as regular convolution when we apply the indices. Uh, but the downside is that we need to store these indices. And we need to remember this. Uh, locations. So here is uh, an example of the uh, deconvolution operation. Uh, uh, starting from the original image, we can see after we pass it through the encoder part, we can see what each component of the decoder uh, has as uh, output. So we start by the um, uh, deconvolution layer. So basically, this is uh, a deconvolution at the resolution of 14 by 14. Then we apply unpooling, and you can see immediately that some fe the features become much more detailed when we do the unpooling. So we process this again through deconvolution. We apply unpooling, and we end up with um, the final result here. So comparing the performance of uh, the deconvolution net with uh, the FCN net, um, you can see that it retains much more uh, finer details uh, in the image rather than the FCN. So uh, another network that follows uh, the similar similar idea uh, to the Covnet but has some uh, minor differences is the Segnet. Um, it basically has also some batch normalization layers in there to improve training, uh, and again relies on this uh, pooling with indices approach to upsample. Uh, the image uh, in general is slower than fully con the fully convolutional network because of this uh, indexing and having to um, remap locations from feature maps. Um, but it has a lower memory requirement during both training and testing because we don't have to um, um, save uh, store feature maps. We just store indices and. For the same reason, the model is uh, 
uh, is smaller than FCN. So one key ingredient of the second net is the use of these uh, max pooling indices in the decoder to perform the upsampling of the lower uh, feature maps. Uh, this results in a reduction of the total number of uh, parameters. And it has also as a result um, that it better is able to better retain uh, higher frequency details and uh, finer details in the image because it uses this um, indexing approach. So you can see here um, the difference that we have when we have um, unpooling versus deconvolution. So in the FCN, we have um, uh, the dimensionality reduction path uh, and that we have to um, uh, also upsample through deconvolution, which has uh, which requires doing all these multiplications, and then we need to add um, back the dime sampled version. So this increases the number of operations we want to do compared to just uh, re-indexing the values into a larger array. This is one of the major uh, benefits of using uh, deconvolution. Another uh, seminal approach in uh, segmentation is uh, the UNET uh, framework, the UNET network. Uh, it's an upgrade over the simpler fully uh, convolutional architecture, uh, and it relies on upsampling, uh, not using the unpooling method, but using uh, some skip connections. So in general, it, ad it adopts the same encoder decoder framework like uh, SecNet and FCN, uh, but uh, it gets the finer details from uh, layers from the encoder rather than uh, having to um, upsample using indices. So in total, uh, it has 23 convolutional networks and uh, it's, as we will see in the architecture, it has uh, this symmetrical uh, U-shape because the two paths are uh, between the encoder and decoder are symmetrical. Uh, it was initially developed for uh, biomedical image uh, segmentation, and because of that, uh, since the data were not uh, plenty, they used extensive uh, data augmentation, uh, so they were able to train on very few images, uh, and um, uh, they use different methods like uh, deformations of the image and of the uh, segmentation map as well, because they have to be aligned. They uh, did some data extrapolation by mirroring images or parts of the images, and uh, they also cropped images and expanded them to have uh, to increase the size of the of the training set. And, Overall, it's a, it's a seminal work in semantic segmentation. So the main idea of uh, UNET is uh, these uh, skip connections. The idea behind skip connections is um, uh, if you simply stack these uh, encoder and decoder layers, you could use uh, lose a lot of information uh, in terms of spatial uh, resolution. So, um, for example, the, the boundaries in images uh, can be um, uh, can be um, recovered using information from the encoder. That's the uh, the main uh, contribution of the skip connections. And um, in addition they allow to, uh, the gradients to flow better because we have different paths that can propagate the, um, the signaling of, of, of the gradients. And in general, they improve the multi-scale uh, information that we can uh, use to process uh, the image. And this is basically the uh, conceptual way of um, understanding skip connections. 
So at every step of the decoder, we get uh, the same feature map uh, the, uh, from the encoder. We concatenate um, their output, and uh, we then process them in the following layer through uh, another convolution. And we do that for different parts of the encoder. So this allows us to mix together the high semantic information that we get from the decoder with the more um, texture and image level uh, information from the um, initial layers of the encoder uh, at, that, at the same level. So the idea in UNIT was to have these two paths together. The main um, uh, paths of the uh, of UNIT are the uh, contraction path and the expansion path. And uh, the main role of the encoder was to capture the context in the image, to summarize the context in an image. Um, and uh, it follows a typical architecture of a convolutional network, so it has uh, repeated applications of um, um, unpadded uh, three by three convolutions, followed some by uh, ReLU activations uh, and max pooling to reduce the size of the feature map. And basically, uh, when it's downsampling the feature map, it also doubles the number of channels. On the other hand, the decoder part, we have the upsampling to recover the spatial locations. Um, and uh, it basically uh, halves the output uh, feature maps. And the skip connections here come from the encoder, and they are concatenated with the feature maps uh, of the encoder. And again, we have some um, three by three convolutions after each concatenation. Finally, we use one by one convolutions to map. Uh, 64 channels to the number of classes. So if we have 20, it's mapped 20 to a 20 feature um, output. And here is the uh, architecture of UNIT. You can see why it's called UNIT. It has this uh, U shape uh, from the uh, different paths. So starting at the input, we have some uh, convolutional layers that basically uh, do some feature extraction. Uh, then the size of the uh, feature map is reduced, and then we have some other convolutions, and we keep doing that until we reach um, a 32 times downsampling rate. And then uh, we keep upscaling the feature maps by also concatenating the, uh, uh, the feature map coming from the same level at the encoder, okay? So we do the concatenation, we do the convolution. Again, we concatenate with the exact previous layer. Uh, and uh, at each point, uh, we also upscale, concatenate, and we reach the final output uh, segmentation map. So it's quite, um, uh, it's, a, it's a simple idea, but it turns out to be very effective to combine the information that uh, the encoder extracts and uh, add it back to the decoder to obtain a much finer uh, level detail. So in essence, we have uh, two types of architectures that uh, mostly rely on, uh, on downsampling the image. Uh, we have the simple encoder and code decoder architecture uh, with upsampling. And the UNET approach, where we have some skip connections between encoder and decoder. So the common theme here is this continuous downsampling of the input, which of course can still cause problems because we're every time we downsample, we're losing some uh, information. Now to 
combat this, um, some uh, different types of convolutions have been proposed. This is um, uh, what we call dilated convolutions or attrus convolutions. Attrus is uh, is French. Is that is uh, stands for um, having a hole, and we'll see later why that uh, that makes sense. So these layers are used to reduce the effect of downsampling, and um, it basically uh, the main idea is that instead of downsampling the feature map, we upscale the kernel, but we do it in a way that it does not increase uh, the number of parameters that the kernel has. But at the same time, we allowed it to see a much larger area of the uh, of the input. So this is um, an illustration of uh, what is a dilated convolution. As you can see, it's quite similar to the regular convolution, but um, the gray, the darker areas which correspond to the kernel are now spaced apart uh, between. So in this case, we have the parameters corresponding to a three by three kernel, but they're applied on an area that corresponds to a five by five kernel. And so basically this spacing or these holes between the kernels is what gives, uh, gives the name and it allows the kernel to look at the higher um, and a much larger receptive field, but at the same time maintain uh, the, the same number of uh, parameters. So the dilated convolutions uh, increase uh, the size of the receptive field by uh, a parameter. Uh, so this is a, a parameter that uh, we can set in a convolutional, a dilated convolutional layer to increase its size. Uh, and this can vary from a layer to layer. So here, for example, we have um, the feature map one produced by a, a previous layer. It's in this case, it has a dilation of uh, one, which means that the kernel is um, uh, corresponds to a typical convolution. Uh, we convolve this with uh, this kernel, and we get another output, F2. Um, we can apply here, instead of downsampling this, we can apply a kernel with a dilation of 2, which corresponds to a 7 by 7 or a similar kernel. Again, we convolve this with this mask. And uh, at the next level, instead again of downsampling, we have a dilation rate of, uh, we increase the dilation rate of the um, of the kernel, which has the same effect. But in all these operations, we are working on the same uh, feature map size. And we can use um, dilated convolutions in place of uh, where before we had um, some um, downsampling. And we usually do, do this in the uh, deeper layers where the, the uh, downsampling gets really um, high and we uh, lose a lot of information. So in the FCN structure, for example, we could remove the downsampling um, uh, and change the convolutional layers at that and those uh, layers, for example, the last few layers here, we could remove the downsampling or striding, and we instead can uh, increase the dilation rate accordingly at each layer uh, so that we have the same effect. But we are operating on the same uh, spatial resolution across all these uh, layers. And the advantage here is that this enables uh, and it enables us to the network to learn um, more of a global context. So we're not losing information. And on the other hand, we can uh, use more of the spatial uh, dimension. And here, here's an example 
of uh, the effect that the dilation has on uh, the uh, on the quality of the output. So uh, on the top we have a more standard um, um, layer, like uh, we have a downsampling, a convolution, and then an upsampling. And you get, uh, can see the result is a bit. Uh, it's like small dots, so we have lost some of the uh, of the details. But on the other hand, if we substitute this, we keep the feature map the same. We substitute this with uh, uh, convolution with the um, uh, rate of two, then we get a much uh, better, much uh, smoother, and with more detail uh, output. So this shows you in practice a bit um, the advantage of actuous convolutions. And as I said, the uh, dilated convolutions are particularly suited and work well when we want to have some uh, multi-scale information. Um, and we want to find more, uh, to use more of a global uh, context. And uh, this is, illustrated in this image here, where we have um, two patches of the image, one larger and one smaller. And as you can see, uh, in, in the uh, more localized patch, it's difficult uh, to understand what type of um, animal this is. But if we also include some higher level context, uh, we can make this prediction uh, much easier. And this is uh, the main idea of some of methods used in semantic segmentation. So, for example, in the paper um, of uh, uh, Pyramid uh, Scene Parsing Network, uh, we exactly have this idea of uh, combining and exploiting global context to improve the semantic uh, information. So, as you can see, in this figure, we have the input image. Um, we have some part that is the feature extractor. Um, it could be, for example, a ResNet in this particular work. Um, the main difference is that uh, the ResNet used in this work is um, the applied dilated convolutions. So they did not downsample the feature maps uh, as in the original ResNet, but rather they upsampled uh, the kernels, and uh, then they apply different convolution sizes on the feature map so that they could extract more uh, of a global context. And uh, they combine these results and concatenate them into uh, uh, one feature map, and then they make the predictions based on this aggregation of um, of features from different levels. So in this way, the uh, pyramid scene parsing network is more well suited to learn uh, a better, uh, better global context uh, representation of a scene. And you can see here in a bit more detail the different um, uh, the different paths that the um, output gets gets through so that it's uh, then combined. So as you can see, we have some um, uh, different kernel sizes, which basically means that we're looking at uh, different uh, contexts. Uh, we pass that through different convolutional networks. And then these are, the, again, um, interpolated. Uh, and then we get the uh, final concatenated result, which is then used for prediction. Some key features of this architecture, as I mentioned, it uses the base ResNet, but it substitutes some of the convolutions with uh, dilated convolutions in order to keep the size of the feature map relatively high. Uh, and introduced some auxiliary losses. So that means uh, it uh, basically made predict predictions at different layers um, to optimize the learning. But at the end, in during inference, they only use the final um, layer. 
and they use bilinear interpolation to upsample the lower dimensional feature maps so that they all have the same uh, size at the end. And this is uh, some more uh, qualitative uh, results that you can see. So uh, compared to FCN, uh, it manages to uh, um, to make the correct predictions. For example, in the first case, in the top row, uh, FCN predicts the car, whereas uh, PSPNet correctly predicts the boat. Another important observation is uh, in the building in the middle, the FCN uh, predicts some uh, uh, different classes um, uh, for a skyscraper and building, but uh, PSP, uh, because it uses this context, or it also captures context around the object, it's able to make the correct prediction. And lastly, um, the um, pillow there for FCN is uh, completely gone, that uh, because it has um, a similar uh, texture to the, to the rest of the bed, but for PSP, it it's able to understand and uh, make a correct prediction. So, you see here that the, the idea of adding global context uh, makes a lot of difference in the in the details. Uh, similarly to um, to that work, we also have the line of works uh, from Google, uh, which are called uh, Deep Lab. Uh, they also make extensive use of uh, dilated convolutions. Um, uh, and in addition, they also have some uh, conditional uh, random field at the end to do some fine tuning on the final segmentation output. Uh, this was the first work by uh, Google. They also had a version one, version two, and finally came up with a more enhanced version three uh, and three plus. And this is uh, the final architecture that they proposed. Um, I think this is for the version three, not the three plus. But in case the ideas are uh, quite similar, so uh, um, they use actual convolutions to do the pyramid pull, the spatial pyramid pulling, rather than normal convolutions as we had with uh, PSP.NET. And uh, they uh, encode uh, spatial information much more efficiently because. Uh, the dilated convolutions would require much less parameters than the um, the uh, original versions. So the um, spatial pyramid pooling is uh, able to encode uh, the multi-scale contextual information. And they also made some other uh, additions to uh, the previous architecture uh, that they proposed in version three. So they uh, basically now recover and add back uh, the spatial information. Uh, and they used um, a model called Exception, which uh, um, is one of the models that is available and trained on ImageNet. They used that to build their uh, backbone and so made some improvements uh, on that network. They removed all max pooling operations and uh, added some striding to the convolutions to reduce the speed, the spatial resolution of feature maps. Uh, they had added also uh, back normalization and relu activations. Uh, and they made extensive use of de depth-wise convolutions uh, in the spatial pyramid pooling, which makes uh, the whole uh, process much more efficient. And this is for the decoder part. Now for the encoder part, uh, they used a bilinear uh, upsampling to first increase the feature maps uh, uh, by four times at two different levels. Uh, and they used the made use of one by one convolution so that um, uh, the the uh, uh, level of the layers from the encoder and the decoder match, so they could add them together. And then they made predictions on uh, on this upscaled version of from the uh, decoder. 
So they train first the backbone network on uh, ImageNet, and then they added on top this decoding layer so that they could uh, fine tune it on segmentation. And here are some of the results uh, that they obtain. As you can see, uh, the details and the boundaries of the objects are much, uh, much better than what we saw before in the FCN. But still, there are. If you look at the bottom row, there are some uh, challenging cases, primarily because of the of the lighting conditions, and uh, also in the third column, uh, there the car is upside down, which doesn't make it. Uh, probably in the training set, they didn't have that much upside down cars, which could uh, this could affect the performance. So up to this uh, point, we saw uh, some separate works that deal with detection. Uh, so basically doing predictions on uh, bounding boxes and labels. And we saw some works that did semantic segmentation. So they predict the uh, pixel level labels, but they cannot distinguish between different instances of objects. So uh, in this case, in the segmentation, uh, we have all these uh, five persons here. This technique cannot distinguish between uh, these five people here, but it provides us pixel level information. Whereas on the other side, we have detection, which can distinguish between different instances, but does not provide us with pixel level information uh, about the um, which pixels are actually the object. Uh, the question is, uh, can we do both? Can we have at the same time some form of uh, pixel level information, but um, some instance level um, discrimination? Uh, and the answer, the answer is uh, yes. And this task is called instance uh, segmentation. So here, uh, as you can see, uh, we have some bounding boxes that give us um, an instance level um, discrimination of objects that belong to the same class. And with, uh, we also get pixel level information, uh, but uh, we have a different color for each different object. And this is um, a process called instance a segmentation that basically merges together uh, some sort of detection with bounding boxes and semantic information at the pixel level. Notice here, however, that uh, we do not get any um, information about the background uh, areas, only for objects that uh, we're interested in detecting. This is in contrast to semantic segmentation that gives an output for every single pixel in the image. So uh, the most famous model that achieves this is the uh, mask RCNN model. Uh, it's a model that's developed uh, from Facebook. So I'm pretty sure that whenever you upload uh, an image on Facebook, you have this model or an improved model like this to analyze and uh, see what's in the image that you upload. Uh, and it, if you recall from the previous lecture where we saw the faster CNN and faster CNN methods, this is uh, similar to that with the only uh, difference that it uh, adds another uh, head for doing segmentation of each uh, bounding box of each region. So in addition to predicting categories uh, and bounding boxes, it predicts also the labels of the pixels in that box. So as you can see in the image here, the mask RCNN predicts uh, the boxes. And for the same regions, it also predicts pixel level uh, class predictions, uh, and you can see them together. And it, in this way, because it uses 
the information at the box level, it's able to distinguish between pixels belonging to one box and uh, pixels belonging to another box. The major contribution of Masker CNN was the um, refinement of the uh, ROI pooling. So if you recall from the previous lecture, ROI pooling is when we just um, uh, segment uh, our feature in some uh, in a number of cells, and for each cell, we output the maximum value uh, from that uh, area. And in some cases, when the uh, feature map was not divisible uh, by the number of cells, we quantized uh, some uh, um, uh, the the dimensions, and in in, in Basically, uh, so in some cases, we had more uh, values for one cell and less for others. Um, the Mascar CNN approach proposed to do this uh, in a different way, in basically what is called a ROI aligned uh, method. So rather than having uh, non even regions, it keeps the regions even and uh, basically interpolates the values uh, in each cell. So as you can see on the um, uh, on the on the left, we have uh, we don't basically quantize uh, the, the output of the of the bounding box to meet some predefined size, but rather uh, how many values we have in that particular box, we interpolate them. So um, you can see here how this changes the way that we cap get image. Um, capture pull features from uh, the feature map. Uh, and in this way, they were able to improve the localization uh, of uh, their method and make it possible to predict um, semantic uh, maps. And this is uh, the, um, the two different paths that predict the um, uh, the different core, uh, the different um, outputs. So we saw in the previous class um, how the top uh, path can predict class and boxes, and for uh, the bottom path, you see that is uh, basically a convolutional uh, neural network again, working at a lower resolution. Uh, and at the output, we have um, a tensor that has equal number of classes. So this gives us for every object a, a, a 28 by 28 mask, which we then, um, uh, based on the information in the bounding box prediction, we can resize that to match the, um, the size of the bounding box. So we have some stage that uh, we basically um, uh, resize and do some minor fine tuning of the output so that it matches the bounding box. And then we overlay that mask on the bounding box and we get um, these results right here. As you can see, it's uh, quite impressive to look at it and it, it's able to identify big objects like the, the people here, uh, but also even small objects like uh, the cell phone, for example. So it's quite effective uh, and it's impressive when you uh, look at it in action. Here is another uh, video demonstrating the uh, uh, capabilities of uh, mask or CNN. As you can see in, in some cases, the color changes from one frame to another. That's because the color does not associate objects between frames, it's just there to do some, uh, you know, for visualization purposes, to distinguish between uh, different instances. Now, looking at the overall performance of uh, Mascara CNN, uh, it's quite uh, um, impressive. It's much higher than other uh, methods, of course. Um, being a region proposal method, you can imagine that uh, it has a lot of, uh, takes a lot of time to process such an image. Uh, that's why you will mostly use it or see it in uh, um, 
higher end uh, applications and not so much in embedded. But uh, is, uh, this is freely available in PyTorch, so you can play around it with it and um, build your own um, method. And here, just to uh, close the picture, is uh, um, a predict um, different predictions coming from different models, just to understand the main differences and the main um, uh, ways that uh, these methods can work. So we have on top the two detection methods based on YOLO, version two and version three. Uh, and you can see that version three uh, makes much uh, a better work at detecting um, smaller uh, people that are further away from the camera. You have on the bottom the Mascar CNN method that uh, on top of the bounding boxes gives you pixel labels and then you have uh, the deep lab method on the on the right that gives pixel information for all for all the um, pixels in the image now there is a, a newer work uh, from facebook that was presented in uh, cvpr 2019 uh, essentially what they want to do is combine uh, two bottom approaches so you have the bounding box, you have the semantic information for the bounding box, and at the same time, they also uh, classify all the pixels that belong to uh, the background or um, areas that are not, do not um, correspond to, um, to a bounding box prediction. So they give you, so they actually combine deep lab with uh, a semantic segmentation technique with uh, the mask or CNN framework, and what is called uh, panoptic uh, segmentation. So we can use the, this encoder decoder architecture is quite it's quite powerful because it can get an image, build a representation, and then uh, decode it into all sorts of different types of uh, predictions. So uh, similar ideas have uh, that we have discussed in uh, for semantic segmentation can uh, also be used for things like uh, depth estimation or uh, predicting surfaces that are normal to the um, ground plane to do image colorization and many more. So let's quickly go through some of this just to get an intuition. Um, we have also for the same Mascar CNN uh, framework, we can um, add some more uh, post-processing or uh, additional layers on top and we can also do prediction of key points and pose estimation. So we can predict how an object, uh, the rotation of the object and some uh, key points that are basically some, uh, the joints of the, uh, of the object. Uh, using the same network, um, like uh, decoding and encoding, we can also do prediction of depth from a single image. So if we have a training set, uh, for this purpose, we can train a convolution on your network to output uh, a color-coded depth map to say how close an object is or how far away it is, just from a single image. Whereas we saw in the previous lecture that uh, we need a stereo pair to do that. Also, in a, in a similar fashion, we can predict uh, surface orientation and find surfaces that are uh, normal to the ground plane. And these applications are uh, important when we have uh, augmented re reality uh, applications or um, um, uh, when we want to uh, grasp things or manipulate things, it's important to know the orientation of the different uh, services, uh, surfaces in, in the area. Uh, we could use the same approach to um, colorize uh, old images that we captured through a, a grayscale image, for example. Um, uh, we could also do this with um, a, um, in a general framework. We can do this as uh, image to image translation um, a problem, where we have one uh, input in, input image in one domain and want to translate it into another domain. So for example, 
we can have the inverse where we have the labels and we can generate a scene based on the labels. It's a novel scene that we have not encountered before. In a similar fashion, we could have, um, uh, we can turn an image that was taken uh, during the day uh, and then the same image, but as if it was taken uh, during the night. We could also sketch realistic uh, images from, um, from sketches or uh, edge information. And these are some of the things that uh, we can use, we can do with this encoding and decoding um, architecture. Uh, and then as we will see in the, in the next lecture, if we combine this architecture uh, with some uh, newer learning techniques like adversarial learning, uh, we can have quite um, uh, impressive results in, in terms of um, taking, taking one form of, a, of an image and um, transforming it into uh, something else, another image or a, a 3D model. So Pat will have a look uh, on this more in more detail in uh, the next next class. So today, um, just to recap, we have seen how we can use uh, deep learning to do semantic segmentation, that is um, to perform classification at the pixel level. So every pixel in the image to determine its class. We saw how we can build on approaches that use classification and detection to encode the input into a, a, a more um, dense representation. And then how we can apply uh, some new approaches for uh, layers and upsampling to build decoders that will uh, transfer that semantic information into the uh, image um, output. And we saw some popular networks like uh, fully convolutional networks, UNET, uh, DeepLab, and the mask CNN that are today ex are extensively used for uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, and in general, this combination of detection and segmentation is uh, uh, quite interesting um, as we want to learn um, two different uh, tasks at the same time, but it's also been uh, of interest for trying to learn from one task to another. So uh, if we have only bounding box labels, can we learn segmentation just from that without having to, to label each pixel in an image? And all these have many applications. So for example, uh, in automotive, uh, in autonomous vehicles, uh, it's important to know the state of the whole in, uh, world around you for a vehicle to make a correct decision. And of course, for medical applications um, where we want to help doctors make more um, informed decisions, semantic segmentation can uh, pinpoint uh, areas where the doctor may have missed. So this and many more that we also see in uh, in the next class are some really interesting applications and there's a lot of um, uh, of room for improvement and, and working on uh, improving uh, these uh, methods.